Move on to oral questions put by members to ministers. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. We all understand that, according to the plan, cannabis was to be legalized on July 1st of this year. Now we're hearing out of Ottawa that legalization will happen possibly at the end of summer. Student groups like the Canadian Students for Sensible Drug Policy are suggesting that universities need designated pot smoking areas. They are actually advocating, Mr. Speaker, that universities ought to consider creating pot bars along the line of bars that serve alcohol. So is the Premier going to allow the establishment of cannabis bars on Nova Scotia University campuses? The Honourable Premier. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the Honourable Member for the question. Uh, thank the Minister of Justice, who's been working diligently uh, along with many other departments to ensure that we have uh, the most progressive uh, piece of legislation when the introduction of uh, cannabis happens in our country. We're continuing to work with those. Uh, Mr. Speaker, in some cases we've treated that, as the Minister talked about today, as impaired driving, as an alcohol substance. There's other cases where we have allowed uh, that uh, when it comes to consumption public, it'll be around uh, the Smoking uh, Smoke Free Places Act, which we've actually uh, tightened up uh, to exclude places that were currently allowed to smoke uh, cigarettes, where we removed that. And we've also left a provision uh, where municipalities and uh, in some of our cases, our sister institutions can even go further if they like. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. So, Mr. Speaker, when parents send their children off to university, they expect government to provide guidelines that will keep their children safe. And students are now currently applying for fall admissions to various universities in our province. There, if there are going to be differences, though, Mr. Speaker, from one campus to another, students and their parents need to know this now, because it will matter to some. So, when can Nova Scotians expect clear rules regarding pot consumption on campuses? The Honourable Premier. Uh, Mr. Speaker, they're very clear today. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition on her final supplementary. That's not what we're hearing, uh, but if you want to table that, uh, that would be wonderful. Previously, my colleague from Inverness asked a question um, regarding cannabis rules for apartments and condos. Another multi-unit building that I don't believe was contemplated in his question is university dormitoriums, dormitories. One could read that the current rules which I've read, in a way that permits every dorm room to house up to four plants of cannabis. Does the Premier plan to create a province-wide policy for cannabis cultivation on campuses? The Honourable Premier. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank again the Honourable Member for the question. Again, I want to thank the Minister of Justice for the tremendous work that he's been doing in and around ensuring that we uh, move forward with this piece of legislation whenever this product or substance is legalized in the country. Uh, we continue to make sure that we've reached out to our partners to ensure that uh, we have struck the right balance. We're continuing to ensure, uh, Mr. Speaker, that we continue to provide a safe environment uh, in our province for all Nova Scotians, as you would know, the uh, Smoke Free Places Act uh, deals with that particular issue. Uh, the fact of the matter is we're continuing to make sure we uh, provide that environment and the consistency across our province and also, Mr. Speaker, living in the reality of today. The Honourable Leader of the New Democratic Party. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Fifteen cents. That's what the minimum wage has gone up this week in Nova Scotia, Mr. Speaker, to $11 an hour. Me meanwhile, uh, in Alberta, in six months, uh, the minimum wage is slated to go up to $15 an hour. And in Ontario, in nine months, it's slated to go up to $15 an hour. So I want to ask the Premier, on behalf of 130,000 people in Nova Scotia who are working today for less than $15 an hour, how does he think we can get where we need to go as a 15-cent jurisdiction in a $15 world? 
The Honourable Premier. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank uh, the Honourable for the question. As you know, the, that increase was based on the structure uh, that was put in place by the former NDP government. Those increases have been based on, on the committee that they'd put together back when they were in government. I have also told this House, so working with my colleagues across Atlantic Canada, our hope is to arrive at a where we can find a common minimum wage inside of Atlantic Canada and continue to ensure that they will have uh, structured increases that reflects the cost of living within our province. But in the meantime, Mr. Speaker, what we we'll continue to do uh, ensure that we provide Lee, more money in the pockets of hard-working Nova Scotians by increasing the basic personal uh, uh, basic personal exemption, Mr. Speaker, for the, for those uh, low-income Nova Scotians to ensure that they keep more of their investment. It's why we've continued to make sure we have universal pre-primary programs across the province to get more people back into the workplace, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we know uh, there's more work to do, and we're continuing to collaborate and work with our partners to ensure that we achieve all that we want to achieve. Leader of the New Democratic Party. Mr. Speaker, the tax changes of which the Premier speaks stand to put hundreds of dollars in people's pockets, but the difference between $11 and $15 an hour would put thousands of dollars every year in the pockets of these 130,000 people. So in this sense, the Premier's answer indicates to me an, an inadequate awareness of what is actually happening in actual economies in Canada on this front. What's actually happening in the actual economy of Ontario at the moment is in the sector that has the greatest concentration of minimum wage employees. Uh, accommodations and food services. Uh, employment is up for two years, two months, hand running since the big change in minimum wage on January 1st. So, Mr. Speaker, I want to ask the Premier is he actually as unaware as his government's actions seem to indicate of the mounting and the cross jurisdictional evidence there is of the benefits to an economy of a substantial, a, a, a substantial and d dramatic increase in the minimum wage? The Honourable Premier. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member actually answered his question in his preamble. The fact of the matter is he is correct, Mr. Speaker. There are more people working in low-paying jobs in Ontario, Mr. Speaker, but they're getting fewer hours. The fact of the matter is the pockets of those hard-working Ontarians, Mr. Speaker, has less money in it today because of the very changes he's advocating from behalf of the people of Nova Scotia. What we have worked towards is ensuring that we've left more money of the paychecks that those hard-working Nova Scotians are achieving, ensuring that we're putting in place the infrastructure that allows them to get back into the workforce, reduce the amount of income they're paying, Mr. Speaker, on child care, everything I know is very passionate about. All of those things, Mr. Speaker, are a meaningful impact on the hard-working Nova Scotians in our province at the same time when the employers are continuing to make sure their hours stay steady. The Honourable Leader of the New Democratic Party. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The effect of the 15-cent change this week is to make us now in Nova Scotia, the jurisdiction in Canada, with the second lowest uh, minimum wage in the country uh, by a whole differential of four cents. Mr. Speaker, I want to ask the Premier, is this what he wants to be remembered by? That after five years of governing, Nova Scotia has been brought up to a place of being the second worst. The Honourable Premier. Mr. Speaker, again, I want to thank uh, the Honourable Member for the question. I want to remind him, uh, Mr. Speaker, that we continue to reduce uh, the weight for uh, income housing in our province. We reduced it by 20% affordable housing. We've made a commitment to reduce it by another 30. Uh, we're on track. I want to remind the Honourable Member we have one of the best performing economies inside of Canada. I want to remind the Honourable Member in the last two years we've seen more young people choose to live in this province than leave, Mr. Speaker. Those are all positive signs of an economy moving forward. We know uh, hard-working hard -working families in this province need support. It's why we brought in the pre-primary program, Mr. Speaker, one that wasn't supported by his party. We're going to continue to work, ensure that they're subsidized uh, daycare for those in individuals who require our support. We're going to continue to make sure, Mr. Speaker, that those hard-working Nova Scotians get to keep more of their own money and put it in their pockets. Mr. Speaker, those events and those public policy positions are having a huge impact on those Nova Scotians who require our support. The Honourable Member for Northside Westmount. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, about a year ago I asked the then Minister of Health about the long-term viability of the emergency room at the Northside General Hospital. The Health Minister of the day said, and I quote, all governments have committed to keeping the Northside viable for now and for the future. And I'll table that, Mr. Speaker. At the time, I asked the Minister to commit in writing to keep the Northside General Emergency Room open. Mr. Speaker, he did not fulfill that commitment. Now, the community is hearing that the ER at the Northside General will be closing beginning in May. So my question to the Minister of Health, will the Minister tell this House today if the Emergency Room at the Northside General is closing, when it will reopen, or if the closure is permanent? 
<clears throat> the Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we've uh, engaged in uh, several conversations, the member and, and indeed uh, many of the members uh, representing uh, the uh, industrial Cape Breton region, uh, Mr. Speaker, have, have asked about uh, with this Northside uh, General or other uh, community hospitals uh, in the region, Mr. Speaker, and the challenges of uh, maintaining their emergency rooms. Uh, we know that there are some staffing challenges uh, there, but of course uh, in community hospitals across the province, Mr. Speaker, uh, we continue to uh, work diligently to uh, ensure that we have appropriate staffing in place uh, to uh, to serve the communities uh, when that's not possible uh, mr. speaker uh, there are times when those uh, hospitals try to be closed we try to give as much warning as possible uh, before that uh, takes place the honorable member for Northside Westmount okay, mr. speaker but I don't think I heard an answer if it was closing not closing or otherwise you got your answer. mr. Closing. speaker the fact of the matter is there's an acute doctor shortage at the ERs in Cape Breton because of the actions of this government ER doctors at the north side of Glace Bay are paid less than the emergency room doctors to the Cape Breton Regional Hospital, even though they work just as hard and have no backup, Mr. Speaker. One emergency room doctor in each of those places, two with the emergency room in, in Cape Breton Regional. Changes to pay for locum doctors made by this government mean that locum doctors no longer want to come to the north side because they will be out of pocket for expenses. So my question to the minister, will the minister admit that starving out the emergency room doctors at the north side and Glace Bay is this government's way of forcing them to close? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, that wouldn't be the case at all uh, from our perspective, uh, Mr. Speaker. What uh, what transpired uh, was that we had nine different uh, health authorities. Uh, there were different uh, pay structures and uh, approaches uh, for compensating uh, physicians uh, in hospitals across this province, Mr. Speaker. Since uh, amalgamating the uh, health authority, uh, efforts were made to uh, bring a standardized approach to the compensation practices uh, throughout the province, Mr. Speaker. Uh, so though that work uh, was taking place. Uh, this, uh, Mr. Speaker, has absolutely no foundation in the uh, path that the member opposite uh, was suggesting it would have. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth South. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Education and Early Childhood Development. Throughout our debates on this government's reforms to education, we've expressed concern about the unintended consequences of eliminating school boards. One of these consequences could be the loss of the substantial supplementary funding provided by municipalities like HRM to local school boards. The Halifax Charter requires the municipality to provide these funds to the Halifax Regional School Board, but the board no longer exists. Mr. Speaker, did the minister consult with Halifax Regional Council about supplementary funding before eliminating the elected school boards? The Honourable Minister of Education. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. In fact, I did. I had a conversation uh, with the mayor in relation to this because I wanted to make it very clear that by uh, maintaining the current uh, legal boundaries of each of those educational centers, municipalities will still be able to engage themselves in these sorts of investments and those dollars will remain, will remain regional, uh, Mr. Speaker. So, of course, I hope that all those municipalities who have taken the time to invest in the most important resource we have, our students, will continue to do so because those dollars will remain in their communities. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's not at all clear that this investment will, in fact, continue. And I want to point out that this supplementary funding allows students to benefit from programs and services that might not be available with the general funding previously received by the Halifax Regional School Board. More than 97% of this funding is spent on staffing. In 2016 to 17, the funding pro provided for 130.9 full-time teaching positions and 104 school-based support staff. In addition, a significant portion of the funding is spent to provide enhanced arts and music programs, lower class sizes, and increased student support throughout the region. The total funding for 2017-18 was more than $15 million. Mr. Speaker, will the minister commit to replacing this funding for the the Halifax Regional Education Centre, as it's now called, if it is no longer provided by the municipality. The Honourable Minister of Education. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we have maintained a structure in place that will allow municipalities to continue to invest and ensure that those dollars remain in their communities. Um, that's been made very clear uh, to our municipal partners through my conversations with the mayor. And of course, uh, the only ones that are jeopardizing this, I think, are those opposite who are scaring people into thinking that these sorts of funding opportunities can't remain under the new structure when, in fact, they can be. The Honourable Member for Victoria the Lakes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health. Mr. Speaker, Cape Breton residents are justifiably concerned about the medium and long-term implications 
if the Northside General Emergency Room is closed permanently or even for an extended period. Northside General has more than 36,000 emergency room visits a year. That's about 100 each and every day of the year. Other hospitals in the area are struggling to find doctors to cover the patient load that now exists. The closure may finally cripple the health care system in Cape Breton. So my question is, does the minister have a plan for how patients displaced by the closure at Northside General will be absorbed in a system that is already struggling? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. As the, the member uh, would know, uh, we take uh, a number of steps uh, as government, uh, along with our partners, the Nova Scotia Health Authority, uh, when uh, addressing the challenges in our health care system. Uh, that includes, Mr. Speaker, uh, work uh, around our primary care. We recognize that uh, many of the health care visits to emergency departments uh, stem from people looking for primary care access that they didn't have, Mr. Speaker. We've been working very, very hard uh, with our partners to uh, provide primary care access in communities across the province. We continue those efforts, Mr. Speaker. We continue to invest in primary care and work with our partners to find appropriate ways like collaborative care practices, provide expanded scope of practice uh, opportunities with our nurses, nurse practitioners, family practice nurses, Mr. Speaker, social workers and others to provide that care on behalf of all Nova Scotians, not just in Cape Breton, Mr. Speaker, but right across the province. The Honourable Member for Victoria the Lakes. Mr. Speaker, the decisions made by this government have created the conditions that have now forced the closure of the Northside General Emergency Room. But the conditions also exist at other area hospitals, including the Glace Bay General Hospital. Under market wages are pushing doctors away from these hospitals and towards the regional hospital. This government is changing and adjusting the labour market in order to centralise services in Cape Breton and the patients are the ones being left behind. So my question to the Minister, will the Minister commit to wage parity between the regional hospital and the other area hospitals so that doctors don't have to forego wages to work? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, one of the uh, steps that took place uh, when amalgamating the, uh, pr the uh, nine health authorities uh, into the Nova Scotia Health Authority, Mr. Speaker, was that we got a provincial lens, not just on the, the programs and services that were offered uh, throughout the province to have the opportunity to work towards standardizing them, but also around compensation, Mr. Speaker. Uh, recognize that uh, there were different approaches uh, and different compensation models uh, deployed throughout the province, so steps have been taken, Mr. Speaker, uh, by Order, the... Order, please. The Honourable Minister of Health. Steps have been taken, Mr. Speaker, since uh, coming into, uh, into being, Mr. Speaker, by the Nova Scotia Health Authority to establish standardized uh, compensation programs uh, for emergency department physicians and uh, other roles uh, throughout the province, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Cumberland North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Last week, the, on March 26, Doctors Nova Scotia released six recommendations to encur encourage government to take a population health approach in cannabis legislation, and I'll uh, table their recommendations. There are well-known risks, harmful risks, associated with cannabis use, especially in the developing brain. Doctors Nova Scotia recommend, in order to protect our youth, to establish the minimum age of 21 to either purchase or use cannabis. My question to the Minister of Health, will he take the recommendations of Doctors Nova Scotia and establish the minimum legal age to purchase and or use cannabis to 21? The Honourable Minister of Justice. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank my colleague for the question. Uh, we value the feedback and contribution that uh, Doctors Nova Scotia has contributed, Mr. Speaker, as a matter of fact, uh, five of the six uh, recommendations that my colleague uh, has identified align with government's position. Yes, we differ on age, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we know that there are concerns around the consumption of, of cannabis, Mr. Speaker, but the reality, Mr. Speaker, is quite simply this. Those will continue to consume regardless of the age. It's important that we establish that age to align with neighbouring provinces, to align with our alcohol drinking age, Mr. Speaker, to ensure that the programs and policies we put in place around cannabis consumption are in the best interest of all Nova Scotians and public safety. The Honourable Member for Cumberland North. Mr. Speaker, Doctors Nova Scotia also recommend our government to implement a comprehensive public education and awareness program. 
to promote responsible cannabis use and prevent related deaths of morbidity and mortality, especially harms to our children and youth exposed to cannabis-impaired driving. My question to the Minister of Health is, will his department be taking the recommendations of Doctors Nova Scotia and implement a comprehensive public education and awareness program to prevent cannabis-related injury and deaths. Mr. Speaker, time is of the essence. The Honourable Minister of Justice. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And yes, uh, we are presently, uh, Mr. Speaker, within the Department of Justice working with our partnering departments, as well as the federal government, uh, not-for-profit groups like MAD uh, Canada, who are here today to support the bill, as well as Nova Scotia Liquor Commission, Mr. Speaker. What's important around the education awareness campaign, Mr. Speaker, is that it's progressive and that we're not duplicating initiatives. So the federal government have rolled out two programs, Mr. Speaker, that have educated millions of young people across the country. The average adult doesn't see it because it is being done through the social media outlets. But Mr. Speaker, the province is committed to an awareness and education campaign. We will continue to partner with our colleagues. The education awareness campaign will be progressive and it will be productive. The Honourable Member for Inverness. Questions for the Minister response for the Alcohol, Gaming, Fuel and Tobacco Division. In a question and answer provided to Nova Scotia Liquor Corporation employees, uh, there was a reference making sure cannabis was to be sold responsibly, that retailing would meet all federal and provincial regulations. Now today we see a bill brought forward uh, for legislation, um, but we do not see the regulations, and the legalization date is quickly approaching. Will the Minister tell this House whether their department will be responsible for provincial cannabis regulations and have those regulations been drafted. The Honourable Minister of Justice. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank my colleague for the question. Uh, Department of Justice is the lead, Mr. Speaker, on the uh, the cannabis file and the legalization, uh, consistent with the federal requirements and, and and the responsibilities that they have delegated to the province. We will be ready, Mr. Speaker, uh, when the federal legislation is in place. Uh, we are looking forward, Mr. Speaker, to the introduction of and discussions around the bill. But I want to assure my colleague that Nova Scotia is best positioned of any province as we speak, and we will be ready for the legalization of cannabis. The Honourable Member for Inverness. Well, Mr. Speaker, we want to see what the government intends to do. Legalization of marijuana is going to bring significant change for our country and for our province. Our culture will change. After years of telling young people, say no to drugs, the very act of legalization will normalize the use of marijuana. It will send a message to youth that marijuana is okay. Will the minister share the regulations that he intends to implement before this legislature is asked to pass a bill within the, with the power the government has, what we will then give, with the power we will then give to the government to decide those regulations? The Honourable Minister of Justice. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, one of the things that, uh, that is lost in the discussion around uh, the illicit uh, sale and consumption of cannabis, Mr. Speaker, is that Nova Scotia has the highest consumption rate in the country per capita amongst our youth. Our youth are consuming this at disproportionate rates, Mr. Speaker. The objective of cannabis legislation at the provincial level, Mr. Speaker, is to put safeguards around that retail market, to provide a quality product, Mr. Speaker, and, a, and an education and awareness campaign that help inform individuals around safe consumption, Mr. Speaker. And much like the, 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 uh, the uh, much, much like the efforts put into the reduction of, of uh, smoking tobacco, Mr. Speaker, where we've seen significant progress and accomplishments, we anticipate similar outcomes around the consumption of cannabis as time moves forward. The Honourable Member for Cape Breton Centre. Mr. Speaker, families across our province, including Carly Sutherland's family, are out of luck with their children when their children age out of eligibility for EIBI. At six, children with ASD cease to be the concern of the health system. According to Autism Nova Scotia, some families in this situation are being paying between six and $7,000 per month out of pocket for therapy and respite care because of what's available through their school just isn't enough, and I'll table that. Mr. Speaker, can the Minister explain, the Minister of Health, explain why his government is asking the education system to provide clinical treatment and support that should be the responsibility of the Department of Health and Wellness? The Honourable Minister of Health. 
Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the member uh, for the question. Uh, very timely in light of yesterday's uh, Autism Awareness and Acceptance Day, Mr. Speaker, in light of our, our guests uh, that were here uh, earlier today. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, it's been a long-standing approach uh, to work with our partners across government uh, through uh, the Department of Health and Wellness, uh, Education, Community Services, all offering a range of programs and services and supports uh, for Nova Scotians uh, with autism. Uh, the model and the approach that uh, has uh, been taken and is in place uh, includes, as the member uh, noted, uh, a, a transition uh, for school-aged children uh, to receive the sports and uh, programs through the education program system. And I'm pleased, Mr. Speaker, that uh, we've uh, added an additional uh, $15 million in our budget this year to help work towards inclusive education, which, uh, Mr. Speaker, many uh, uh, children with autism will be able to receive the benefit of that investment. The Honourable Member for Cape Breton Centre. Mr. Speaker, the pot of money that families need in need of respite care for access has actually been cut by 12 percent this, since this government took office in 2013. We also know that our mental health crisis supports don't have the capacity to support those with ASD. ASD. The last autism strategy recommended that the province should evaluate the existing services for families and individuals with ASD, but there has been no update on that strategy. We know from talking to families that the crisis services aren't adequate, but we're not sure if the government is aware. Mr. Speaker, when can Nova Scotians expect a clear plan for families with ASD? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I thank uh, the member for the question. Uh, indeed, uh, one of the things we've done as a, as a government is worked hard to, uh, with, between departments uh, to really break down traditional silos so that, uh, in fact, there's more opportunity uh, for uh, not just uh, ministers, Mr. Speaker, but also uh, staff within departments to uh, engage and uh, look for those opportunities where we can uh, support, bring uh, to bear uh, all supports uh, that we may have uh, when uh, an individual requires uh, investments. Uh, in this case, we're talking specifically about uh, individuals, particularly those uh, at the more acute uh, side of the autism spectrum disorder. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we continue to uh, work together uh, when uh, those cases come forward, and uh, we have programs and supports in place uh, for those that fit uh, m more on the uh, on the um, spectrum, Mr. Speaker, that fit the standard uh, programs we have in place. The Honourable Member for Collaboration Passage. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Community Services. We've heard the Minister say in defence of the uh, inaccurate findings from the Mother's Risk Labs that substance use and abuse is only one of the factors that the Department looks at when it comes to child welfare cases. Often the presence of either illegal or regulated substances from the found form the foundation of community services decision whether to remove a child from the, from the home of the parents. With the pending legalization of cannabis, the department is sure to encounter more cases where children are in a home with cannabis or where cannabis use was not concealed. My question to the minister is, has the department determined whether the presence of cannabis in a home will be counted among considerations for removing a child from the home? The Honourable Minister of Community Services. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I do believe that uh, the Honourable Member is asking me whether it will be counted against the, uh, a parent if they are using a substance that is now legal. It will be treated as alcohol is treated currently. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Coal Arbor Eastern Passage. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her answer. Mr. Speaker, substances don't need to be illegal to cause problems in domestic situations, and of course we all know that alcohol, prescription, drugs, gambling are all perfectly legal, and their presence would not necessarily indicate a harmful environment. However, we are all aware of circumstances where these controlled substances, although legal, uh, can cause breakdown in a family structure, particularly if more than one is used at the same time. With cannabis coming on stream as a legal substance, there is obviously a spectrum of use, some of which is largely benign and some of which could cause parents to fa fall into negligent situations. And there was a situation in my constituency where uh, a set of uh, foster parents were looking to ad adopt a child and they were going to be refused because of cannabis. So the question to the Minister is, has the Department given any consideration as to the threshold of cannabis use um, that may or may not warrant removal of a child from the home? The Honourable Minister of Community Services. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Our number one priority at the, at the Department of Community Services in our Child Welfare Division, Mr. Speaker, is of course the safety of children, Mr. Speaker, and I think that's what we all want here in the House. Mr. Speaker. Nonetheless, Mr. Speaker, there are a variety of factors that go into uh, a decision whether or not a child comes into care of the minister, Mr. Speaker, and I can, uh, I can tell the honourable member that we would look at, at a continuum of behaviours in that family, Mr. Speaker. We want families to succeed. We know that children generally do better when they're at home with their parents, Mr. Speaker, and we will continue to support families so that their children can have the best lives Thank you. The Honourable Member for Kings North. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister responsible for the Nova Scotia Liquor Commission. Mr. Speaker, Senator Judith Seidman of Quebec, a medical researcher and social worker before her appointment to the Senator, said it has recently commented extensively on how cannabis consumption relates to tobacco consumption and how lessons from tobacco cessation programs could be applied to cannabis. She noted that cannabis packaging as proposed by the federal government do not include many of the warnings and graphic images we have come to associate with tobacco. In fact, she stated the packaging does not even meet the World Health Organization standards for plain packaging. My question for the minister is, can the minister responsible for the sale of cannabis comment on whether the NSLC will insist on cannabis packaging that exceeds the federal government's suggestions and meets the World Health Organization guidelines? The Honourable Minister of Justice. Mr. Speaker, and I thank my colleague for the question. Uh, as my colleague alluded, the federal government has laid down the regulations around packaging. Mr. Speaker, we are compelled to comply with the legislation that the federal government has advanced, but I want to also advise my colleague, uh, as we've spoken earlier, the education and awareness campaign, Mr. Speaker, will follow the same methodology as a smoking cessation plan. This is the expectation. This, these are the anticipated outcomes, and we look forward to, uh, to the opportunity to communicate the education and awareness campaign. The Honourable Member for Kings North. I'd like to thank the uh, Minister for the answer. Mr. Speaker, we have in Canada and in Nova Scotia diverging approaches on how regulations address tobacco and alcohol. We did not we do not permit the marketing of tobacco, and we insist on plain packaging and heavily covered in warnings. Alcohol, however, is readily marketed, contains few warnings, and is packaged as producers and marketers so choose. With the co decision to co-locate cannabis and alcohol, one is led to believe that cannabis marketing will fall closer to alcohol marketing. My question for the Minister is, can the Minister responsible for the sale of cannabis articulate how cannabis will be marketed and whether Nova Scotians should expect to see cannabis adverts in their weekly flyers? The Honourable Minister of Justice. Thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And the elements that my colleague is speaking to is captured in federal legislation, Mr. Speaker. There is no marketing permitted uh, around the retail sale of cannabis. The, the model that the Nova Scotia Liquor Corporation will be rolling out, Mr. Speaker, clearly adheres to the federal legislation. And I can assure my colleague and all Nova Scotians that we are taking every, every avenue possible to ensure that the public health and safety of Nova Scotians is maintained. The Honourable Member for Pickrow Centre. Uh, Mr. Speaker, my question is for the uh, Minister of Justice. The proposed federal bill C-45 seeks to amend the Non-Smokers Health Act to prohibit public consumption of non-medical cannabis in federally regulated areas. Outside of federally regulated areas, Bill 45 does not address public consumption. Authority for that lies with provinces and territories. As it stands right now in Nova Scotia, with the exception of private vehicles, people can smoke cannabis anywhere they smoke cigarettes. There are a lot of young families with young children living here, and to have people smoking pot on the street anywhere, anytime, it's not what most Nova Scotians would want. Plan updates to the Smoke-Free Place Act address sport fields and playgrounds, but do not change the rules for general public spaces. Question to the Minister, what is the Minister's plan to ensure that Nova Scotians will not have to be subjected to the odour of cannabis in public places. The Honourable Minister of Justice. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank my colleague for the question. He has, uh, he has rightly identified the enhancement of the Smoke-Free Places Act, Mr. Speaker, to add additional public spaces. But one of the things we've continued to do, Mr. Speaker, from the time that I was Minister of Municipal Affairs was to maintain a positive work relationship with our municipalities. I've engaged our municipal leaders. I've engaged the UNSM executive, Mr. Speaker. We've had this very discussion, and what they are looking for is the ability to further 
those restrictions, Mr. Speaker, in their communities. We'll continue that work relationship with the municipalities, and we look forward to, uh, to what the municipalities choose to do in addition to uh, provincial amendments. The Honourable Member for Pickerow Centre. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the Smoke Free Places Act states no person shall smoke in an outdoor area within four metres of an intake for a building ventilation system, an open window of a place of employment, or an entrance to a place of employment. Cannabis smoke is much more potent than the smell of cigarettes, and we must ensure that those who do not want to be subjected to the secondhand cannabis smoke are protected. Imagine taking your children to the public library only to have them subjected to this very unpleasant odor because someone is smoking close to the entrance. The proposed changes to the Smoke Free Places Act address many other smoking restrictions, but doesn't speak to air intake into public buildings. Question to the Minister. Given the strong smell of cannabis compared to cigarettes, will the Minister commit to requiring cannabis smokers to be more than four metres from the entrance to a public building? The Honourable Minister of Justice. Thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the, the changes that we have made to the Smoke Free Places Act, uh, Mr. Speaker, place further restrictions uh, on those who choose to consume cannabis uh, in public, Mr. Speaker. And, and I think as the legislation uh, unfolds and we have discussions in this legislature, and, and uh, the chamber, uh, there will be a better understanding, Mr. Speaker, of the implications of those amendments. But I want to assure my colleague, uh, we are and have continued to prioritize, Mr. Speaker, the public health and safety of all Nova Scotians, and we'll continue down that road. The Honourable Member for Halifax, Needham. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Immigration. We all agree that population growth through immigration is key to addressing some of the challenges we face as a province. However, the structure of existing immigration programs has resulted in little benefit for rural areas in Nova Scotia. In 2016, for example, 87% of provincial nominees in Nova Scotia intended to settle in Halifax. All communities need access to workers who are also consumers, potential volunteers and neighbours in order to grow their local economies and maintain their communities. So my, my question for the Minister is what actions has she taken to ensure immigration programs meet the needs of rural Nova Scotia? The Honourable Minister of Immigration. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you uh, for bringing the question to the legislature. Uh, indeed, we have undertaken a number of uh, activities through the Office of Immigration by streamlining and dedicating uh, staff to work with uh, not just uh, businesses and employers, but in fact all Chamber of Commerce and all uh, stakeholders. The Atlantic Immigration Pilot is a really exciting opportunity for us, and what we have seen thus far in the last 12 months, since it's only been around for 12 months, is the uptake in outside the HRM area is about 50%, which is very, very, very good, and that is unseen in any other immigration program that we've ever had and in fact uh, any provinces could have. So that is an exciting opportunity for us. The Honourable Member for Halifax Needham. Mr. Speaker, organizations like New Dawn have been calling on the government to establish a pilot program under the Provincial Nominee Program to enable regional immigration quotas and provide settlement services and supports in communities outside of Halifax. They argue that this kind of targeted local approach is needed to grow the regional economies that are being so badly undermined by population decline. So, Mr. Speaker, I, I'd like to ask the Minister if she will commit to working with organizations organizations in Cape Breton to implement programs and policies to increase its share of immigration. The Honourable Minister of Immigration. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I want to assure my colleague and all members of the legislature, in fact, all Nova Scotians, that we are exactly doing that, and absolutely, we will not only commit, but we have been doing that since coming into office in 2013. I personally have visited New Dawn and all the uh, facilities in Cape Breton a number of times as the minister have continued to work with them. In fact, we've expanded, we've started the Y Reach and expanded it to nine areas, nine rural areas across the province to add additional support. We're also working with our Francophone immigration partners, who some of them are in the Cape Breton area as well. So we are doing everything we can, and we will definitely continue to do that. We need uh, partners to work with us as well. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth East. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Education.
Currently, as the Minister is aware, there is curriculum in Grade 9 Healthy Living about thinking critically and making informed decisions around tobacco, cannabis and gambling. Of course, when it comes to cannabis, teachers have been talking about a substance that was illegal in our province and country. In the next academic year, that will change. The old pedagogy won't be as effective, Mr. Speaker. Teachers will require new materials in order to talk about cannabis with their students. My question is this. Will the curriculum in Grade 9 Healthy Living be adjusted to reflect the changes in the law? Thank the you, Honourable Mr. Minister of Education. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. The, the curriculum is ever-changing. It's ever-evolving. We're always looking for opportunities to enhance that curriculum. Uh, in fact, this government, through Bill uh, 72, has committed to bringing more teachers into the department to actually assist us with just that. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. The Honourable Member for Dartmouth East. Mr. Speaker, high school students who have already taken grade 9 healthy living would have talked about abstaining from a substance that was illegal and dangerous to their development. Next academic year, it will be legal, and students in grade 10 to 12 will conceivably not be given any instruction at school about how to safely and responsibly deal with cannabis, which will then be a legal product. It is a gap, Mr. Speaker, with serious implications. My question is this. Will the minister commit to curriculum change in grades 10 to 12 in order to instruct our students about the dangers of cannabis use within the context of legalization? The Thank you, Mr. Honourable Speaker. Minister of Education. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I would remind the member that for most students, 99% of our students, the product still will be illegal for them until they reach the age of 19, Mr. Speaker. Um, the curriculum will be reflective of the health risks, health risks associated with cannabis as it does now, uh, the same way it approaches the conversation around alcohol or opioid use or prescription drug abuse, Mr. Speaker. If the member has any specific recommendations that he believes the department should evaluate in terms of enhancing that curriculum, we'd be very happy to hear it on the uh, floor of the legislature or, uh, or in writing from the member. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Northside Westmount. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Labour and Advanced Education. Cannabis will be legal on July 1st or September 1st or sometime this year, we think, Mr. Speaker. But when, it's, when is only one of the unanswered questions? There are a lot of unanswered questions about its use in Nova Scotia. The health and safety of Nova Scotia workers is a priority for us all. Impairment from cannabis Use could put some workers at risk for injury, especially those who operate heavy equipment. Employers want to promote safe workplaces, but they don't want to violate the rights of the employees. My question to the ministers, has the minister determined whether and how to impose marijuana testing for workers in Nova Scotia? The Honourable Minister of Justice. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank my colleague for the question. One of the elements uh, and discussions that have been taking place both within the Department of Labour and Advanced Education, Mr. Speaker, but amongst the business community are the occupational health and safety elements of, of the consumption of cannabis. Mr. Speaker, most businesses have existing policies as we speak. They will plan to continue to apply those policies, Mr. Speaker, going forward. They've applied them very well in the present environment. We anticipate they will be applied well into the future. The Honourable Member for Northside, Westmount. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, marijuana has been illegal in Canada for about 95 years. There's bound to be some confusion from employers about how to deal with cannabis use when it's, illegal, when it's legal. The federal government struck a committee to help establish federal workplace rules for cannabis. Is that an impasse? And it seems unlikely that any rules will be in place before pot becomes legal. And I'll table that article, Mr. Speaker, in the Chronicle Herald. So my question is, how will the minister protect workers, employers, and public safety when there are no rules around workplace impairment in place when pot becomes legal? The Honourable Minister of Justice. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And as I indicated in my first response, the business community have existing policies and procedures in place, Mr. Speaker, for the consumption of, of intoxicants. That will not change going forward, Mr. Speaker. There may be an enhancement of those policies, but their occupational health and safety the Occupational Health and Safety Committees within those environments, Mr. Speaker, are speaking to this very subject. They're continuing to apply those policies, Mr. Speaker, and we anticipate that they will continue to apply those policies into the future. The Honourable Member for Colchester, Muscadabit Valley. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question, uh, again, is for the Minister of Justice. Uh, we've all had some fun talking about cannabis and the potential impacts that will come from its legislation. But it is a very serious matter and it has serious implications. For decades, cannabis has been the trade of criminals. Criminals who are not easily pushed off their territory. 
The NSLC has a stated goal of eliminating the illicit market for cannabis, and no question it's a noble goal. But the illicit market has its own ideas, and I worry about the things that dealers might do in order to protect their livelihood. My question is, can the Minister of Justice share what law enforcement anticipates will be the counter moves by the illicit market to maintain their trade? The Honourable Minister of Justice. Thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker. One of the ongoing discussions that we've, uh, we've had over the past number of months, Mr. Speaker, as we advance uh, the work around the legalization of cannabis is with our law enforcement community. And the law enforcement community, Mr. Speaker, to this very day, they have and will continue to, to advance an intelligence-led policing model that addresses many of the points that my colleague has identified. Things are not going to change, Mr. Speaker, relative to enforcement. The law enforcement community will continue. I anticipate they may even enhance their efforts now that there will be clarity around legislation, Mr. Speaker, but I assure my colleague that we look forward to continuing to work with our law enforcement community to ensure that the public safety and health of Nova Scotians is maintained. The Honourable Member for Colchester, Muscadabit Valley. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm getting my education on this, um, and I've heard that there is a street drug called Shatter. Shatter is a drug with a concentrated THC content that runs in the area of 80% and sometimes in the 90%. My understanding is that when someone uses Shatter, it renders future use of regular cannabis ineffective. Dealers are attempting to transition their customers from standard cannabis to this Shatter in an attempt to maintain their hold in the market. So my question for the Minister of Justice is, how widespread is the use of shatter, and what are the plans to combat it? The Honourable Minister of Justice. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank my colleague for the question, because what my colleague has actually identified, Mr. Speaker, are the very reasons why we have to regulate the distribution of cannabis. The illicit market, the illicit, the illicit market, Mr. Speaker, is laced with multiple chemicals. A legal, regulated market, Mr. Speaker, will provide quality control. It will provide a safe product, recognizing that there are health implications, Mr. Speaker. It is about eliminating the illicit market. There's a lot of work to do, Mr. Speaker, but I want to assure my colleague, those are the primary focuses of our government's efforts in bringing this bill forward. The Honourable Member for Halifax, Needham. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Natural Resources. Near Wagner's Lake in Shelburne County, 640 acres of forest have been marked for clear-cutting. On paper, that giant clear-cut looks like eight smaller ones because there are thin 50-meter strips of forest that divide it. But from any other perspective, it is one big 640-acre clear-cut. Does the Minister think that such large clear-cuts are good for the future of Nova Scotia's forests? <clears throat> the Honourable Minister of Natural Resources. Oh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'm not totally aware of, of, that, uh, of that section, but often you'll see when you're looking at different uh, laws and, and different uh, cutting plans or, or uh, treatment plans. You'll see uh, avenues there, there are uh, moose, uh, moose paths, or you'll be looking at lichens, and there'll be 150 meters around different lichens. So any kind of a, a, a harvest plan will have different formations that you'll see that are avoiding different issues uh, about um, looking after preservation of lichens or uh, wildlife. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Halifax, Needham. Mr. Speaker, while we await the results of the forestry review, we are hearing news of old growth forests being clear cut for biomass burning and new giant clear cuts being approved. Nova Scotians are losing confidence that the government is committed to ensuring we have high quality forest products for generations to come. And seeing the proposed Wagner Lake cuts, Nova Scotians are frustrated because they expect old growth trees, wetlands, wildlife and soil health will all be ignored. Given the recent revelations of poor oversights of clear cuts in Guysborough County, I share those concerns. So can the minister table for this house documentation showing that department officials have assessed the Wagner Lake sites in person? The Honourable Thank you. Minister of Natural Resources. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank the member opposite for that question. The problem with some of these uh, plans, harvesting plans, is that they've been planned long ago. Just because something was approved a month ago, two months ago, six months ago, doesn't mean that it's going to be harvested in the near future. It may be two years, it might be three years forward. Some of these plans may have been made, you know, many years ago. Other ones that come forward now, they are all assessed on a one-by-one -one basis and actually hit my desk before they go for final approval. So I'm also looking forward to that uh, to the to the Leahy report coming out and start to look at what the challenges we are going to have in the industry in, in making sure that we are we are proper stewards of our forests in Nova Scotia. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Pitco East. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question for the Minister of Justice: Does this government support fair and reasonable access to uh, uh, cannabis for prescription users? Will this government exempt um, uh, cannabis users? for medical purposes from excise taxes. The Honourable Minister of Justice. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, thank my colleague for the question. Uh, my colleague would know that the medicinal stream of marijuana is regulated by federal government health, federal health department, Mr. Speaker. That, that does not uh, interfere, Mr. Speaker. That will be maintained. Uh, the retail sale of cannabis is a different discussion, Mr. Speaker, and we look forward to unfolding this bill over the next number of days. Thank you very much. That concludes the time allotted for oral questions put by members to ministers. We'll now 